Hi, this is part one of a three-part video series in which I'm trying to explore and explain the way in which we can use Amazon's web services in order to do a cloud-based MapReduce task. The first part of our three-part lecture series will be about trying to understand what it is that MapReduce does. The second part will be going through what a piece of code looks like that you will write in Java and then upload to the cluster. And then the third part will be about executing the cloud infrastructure and loading our task onto that cloud infrastructure to get some work done. So this is running a MapReduce job using Amazon's, web's, Amazon's Web Services, part one, MapReduce. My name is Don Patterson, and I teach at Westmont College's Department of Computer Science. So for starters, understanding what MapReduce um, is, it's helpful to know some of the history behind it. It originated in the development of web search engines, primarily in Google's uh, research and development labs. It became clear early on in the development of search engines that there was going to need to be new infrastructure built in order to handle enormous amounts of memory, what became to be known as big data. This is so much data that it doesn't fit within memory at one time. It doesn't fit on one computer at one time, or at least on one hard drive. And in some cases, it doesn't even fit on many computers in one location at one time. So MapReduce is about handling enormous amounts of data and doing processing tasks on that data uh, as, as uh, it's being manipulated. MapReduce is a data flow architecture. It has a particular way in which that it manipulates data. And you can solve a lot of different problems if you can make those problems fit into the style of MapReduce jobs. So start, starting with, we have an enormous amount of data. The MapReduce process has two different steps, the map step and the reduce step. It's a parallel task executed on many different computers, and one of those tasks that you as a developer can design is the map process. There are several different map processes that are introduced into a MapReduce job. Each one of those map processes works on data independently from the enormous set of data that you've got um, as a base set. After the map process is done, Hadoop shuttles data around to a reduce process. Just like the map processes, there are several reduce processes as well, and those operate in parallel in conjunction with the map processes. These are logical processes. They're separated logically, but they may be run on many different pieces of underlying hardware. At this point, it's helpful to just think of them as independent processes. Then finally, when the reduce process is done, you have some transformation of the initial data that represents a change or some analysis that you want done on that really large starting amount of data. So generally speaking, the data flows from left to right, and along the way it gets transformed by the MapReduce architecture as well as the code that's introduced into the map process and the reduce process. For starters, the map process is, is delivered this data by the Hadoop architecture. Hadoop is the implementation of MapReduce um, that's available on Amazon Web Services. Each one of these map processes get a chunk of the enormous amount of data that comes in. And by default, the data is chunked into lines. So one line at a time, each line is considered an atomic unit. And those lines are delivered to the map process, and each line is considered independent. So the map process doesn't necessarily know where in that enormous line of, in, in that enormous amount of data, the incoming data is coming from. It needs to be able to treat each bit independently. By default, each line of data, each line of input data is delivered as one unit to the map process, but that can be changed if you change the configuration of the map file, or, uh, change the configuration of the input uh, in the Hadoop architecture. So those, those lines are broken up among the different map processes, and the ma each map process takes one of those incoming units, one of those lines, and it transforms it somehow. It transforms it into a key and value pair, and it transforms each line possibly into multiple key and value pairs. And so out of the map process, as each bit of incoming data is analyzed and, and um, digested, a whole bunch of key value pairs get passed out of the map processes along the way. The keys are represented by blue, and the values are represented by yellow in this diagram. Each map process sends out lots. It isn't a one-to-one -one relationship between the input lines and the output. It could be more or less, just depends on the task that you're working on. The keys are separate from each other, although they're all the same type, they're all blue, 
And the values are all have different values as well, although they're the same type. They're yellow type in this case. Those get sent out from the map process, and the MapReduce architecture, the Hadoop architecture, takes those and it shuffles them around in a particular way that is the strength of this MapReduce data flow. There's data shuffling that happens that moves each one of those key value pairs into a bucket. And the way in which they are rearranged is such that all of the atoms that came out of the, all the key value pairs that came out of the map process get collated into um, a key and list of values, where any time a key and value pair came out of the map process in which the key was the same, then the value associated with that key is going to be appended to the end of the list that's delivered to the reduce process. So this means that going into the reduce process, each key is only represented once in each one of those lines that you see graphically. Each key, each blue square is going to have a different value, and each of the yellow squares had the same, had the same key when they came out of the map process. The reduce process takes this aggregate amount of data in and somehow transforms it itself into some kind of output, often some kind of text output. It writes those, that data, whatever it wants, and puts it into the transform and, and that becomes the transformation of the data that ends up on the output. Now this is a very generic process. It's a process that can accommodate a lot of different tasks. One of the ways in which you first learn about the MapReduce architecture is to look at, at a particular example of ways in which you can use those, this key value rearranging. Let's imagine that you start with a text file, a really large text file. There are many words in it. And what you would like to do is you'd like to count how many times each word occurs. What you can do is you can pass one line of text independently into a map process. The map process analyzes that line of text, and for each word in that line of text, it's going to output the word as the key, the blue part, and it's going to output the number one as the value, or the yellow part. And so each time it encounters a word, it's going to spit out a key value pair, that word and the number one. Now this is going to be happening in parallel across many different map processes that are each looking at a different portion of the input text. Each map process gets a unique and exclusive piece of the input text. Nonetheless, each one of those processes may be outputting the same word with a one after it, because the same word may occur somewhere else in this test. Te in this input, input text as well. The MapReduce architecture takes all of those words, any of them in which the key, or in this case, what's labeled as word is the same, and it brings them all together from each of those map processes and produces one input to a reduce process in which the key is word and there's one value in the list that follows it for each one of the output key value pairs that came from the map process. Since each one of the output values was a one, what the reduced processes are going to see coming in is a word and a list of ones after it. Now the number of ones that are present be, are equivalent to the number of times the word occurred in the input text way over on the left side. So the reduced process can simply output whichever word it was presented and a count of the number of things that the number of ones that are in the list that follow it. And that becomes the number of times the word has occurred in the document. Writing that out, word 8, tells you that that word occurred 8 times in your document. And in that way, you get a count of all the words that are present. It's a very simple example. This is the one that we're going to do in part 2 of uh, this lecture series. But this framework can be used for much more elaborate things. For starters, you could run this several times over data and create a loop of MapReduce processes. But you could also do simple one-time pass through the data, um, like the word count. And let's say that, for example, coming in, you had a list of transactions in a data warehouse, maybe the outputs of cash register um, data from a retail store. And let's say each transaction consisted of a customer, some kind of customer ID, a list of their transactions, and a total dollar amount. We're going to feed each one of those transactions into the map process. The map process is, going, is interested in just pulling out the user ID and the total of each receipt. Why is it interested in that? Well, because of what we, how we want to transform the data at the end. So the key is going to be the customer, and the value is going to be the total amount on that particular receipt. 
The left side our input is all of the transactions that all of our stores have seen. So over time, we will see that customer multiple times and we'll collect each one of the receipts that they've spent. And so coming into the reduce process, the key will be that particular customer and the elements of the, the list of values that follow it will be the totals for the receipts for any receipts that were present in the input transaction. The reduce process can then add up all the totals of the receipts that are in the list and output a customer ID and all of the total dollar amount that that person has spent uh, over the course of whatever your input data covers. And so this might become a list of customer spends for loyalty programs. Maybe you want to filter this out, filter this output for people who spend over a certain dollar amount and identify these as particularly loyal or high value customers to your company. If you have an enormous amount of transactions, this is difficult to do with just one computer. And so using a MapReduce process could help you um, do this quicker. Those are just two examples of ways in which MapReduce can be, um, can be leveraged. Now, the thing about MapReduce is that we said these map processes and these reduce processes are logical processes. That's me that means that they're being run independently in parallel, different bits of code, but where they're actually being run is being managed by the MapReduce architecture or the Hadoop architecture. They may actually be running on a different set, a different number of underlying hardware computers. Map processes and reduce processes being run distributed in several different locations and the reason why this is beneficial is because the map and reduce processes can be placed uh, by the Hadoop architecture in such a way to minimize the transition of data from one computer to another because the communication across network is relatively slow compared to the transition within one computer from on the disk drive or within memory. Nonetheless, each one of these processes are generating the atoms logically and they get passed around to the appropriate place in order to do the construction of the reduce processes input to create the key and list of values. The other thing that's important to recognize is that the type of the key and the value, particularly since our example is going to be in Java, the type of the key and value can't be anything. Because of the, the restrictions that Hadoop puts in place in order to be able to copy the data around, and the type of the key and the type of the value have to be descendants of the writable class. They have to have the characteristics of the writable class. Now this is um, would be a problem because we'd have to create a bunch of classes, but fortunately Hadoop comes with many very common classes. They're just variants of the standard Java classes that are available, but they have different names. So for example, some common ones you might want would be the int writable, the double writable, the long writable. These are all Hadoop versions of integer, double, and long numeric types. Perhaps a Boolean writable would be helpful. This is a um, Hadoop version of the Boolean class. The text class is a generic string that can be passed around that implements writable. The object writable is a generic writable class that can take a serializable object. And then the map writable class can take a Java map data structure. So these are all um, data structures and types that have been wrapped in this writable wrapper so that you can pass them around effectively within Hadoop but you can't use just the normal um, Java classes, unfortunately. Unfortunately for um, clarity, but in fact, it's not really a big problem to use a different type, so long as you have the patience to look up and see what the name of the corresponding type is that you want to use. So that's it. That's part one of MapReduce, understanding what the MapReduce architecture is doing. In part two, we're going to write the code to generate a MapReduce job, and in part three, we'll put it onto the Amazon cloud. Thank you for your attention.